What do you want? All right, everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started. Oh. Oh, Paul, do you want to run somebody want to run the slides for that? Yes, I okay, think that'd be great. I guess I should stand over here. Just like last month, this is your little picture spot. This is the Zoom box. So the people on Zoom can see you because of the camera and the microphone that's right here on this table. So we're going to make sure that people are here in the front so they can hear us. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to the April 10th meeting. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Sherry, do you want to confirm that you can hear us on Zoom? Oh, you need my phone. <laughs> Check here. Um, nope, you're going the wrong way. Okay, there we go. The agenda for today. Um, we have a couple of guest speakers for tonight. We're going to talk about upcoming events. And um, of course, we'll hear from our legislators. I think I saw one. There's one. Um, and I don't know what the others are. Anyways. Oh, she has some. Okay. Now I'm not sure if Stacy will make it. Um, okay, we'll just skip to the next one. Sherry? I Does anybody want to do the land acknowledgement? I always want to open it to the floor. Oh, got one in the back. Come on up. Yes. Come on. Thank you. Like very recent. There's your camera and your microphone. Hi, everyone. Rebecca Hinton. Yes, yes. She, her. I live in Tempe, Arizona, and I would like to acknowledge that this is the land of the Donna Awesome, Pete Blush, and that's it. Thank you. <laughs> hey, uh, Paul. Okay, sorry. Hey, Paul. You don't have to worry about chat or admitting people. Susie will take care of that. Okay. okay. And the reason is because then everybody sees that. So the next slide. Um, today or this month of April is Autism Acceptance Month. We have a guest speaker, Ron Andrews. Okay. In the, over the, oh, in the box. In the box. Um, tonight we are going to hear from our Tempe Union High School Governing Board member, Amanda Steele. Yes. Stay in the box. Yeah. My first time here. Thank you. <laughs> I was online for so long. Who in this room or online has someone in their life with autism? Okay. So in Arizona, most recently, it's one in 36 have an autism diagnosis before the age of eight, which means it's coming, it's here, and it's time to embrace, accept, and encourage every single person around us to recognize what neurodiversity is and recognize that people with autism bring talent, diversity, experience, and if we embrace them, they can bring a whole new world of love and experience to our, to our future. So I really hope that we all this month learn something, take in some time, and talk to somebody new that you haven't before. Um, something that goes along with Autism Acceptance Month, and it's a huge conversation, is whether or not you should have a puzzle piece or an infinity symbol. And I don't get to have it today, unfortunately, but on April 21st, pay attention to my Facebook page because I'll be showing my most recent tattoo. Um, when my son was first diagnosed with autism, I got a couple of different tattoos because the puzzle piece was a significant sign for those with autism. 
a lot of people thought that they were a puzzle. Well, today, the autistic community, especially those with autism themselves, have spoken out against the fact that they don't like that puzzle piece. They feel it does not represent them, and they don't want to be looked at as a puzzle. They're a human being. And so most recently, over the last couple of years, there's been a lot of conversation on an infinity symbol. So on April 21st, I have an appointment to where I will not only put the infinity symbol on me, I'll put the Maya Angelou quote that when we know better, we do better. So I hope that each of you take us today that autism is not something that you're scared of. For so many years, people apologize to me. It's something to be scared of. It's something to recognize, it's something to embrace, and it's something to realize that a lot of people, even more than we even think of, could have it. So I personally was diagnosed at 38, autistic and with ADHD. Um, so it's time to change that perception and recognize it as a good thing. So happy autism awareness month and acceptance month. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Oh, well, she's going to cancel, but I do have something I want to say in her face. So. Okay, um, we were supposed to hear from Dr. Laura Metcalf, who is a candidate for Maricopa County School Superintendent, but she is not going to be able to be here. So Melissa is going to say a few words really quick, and then we will hear from Selena Washburn from Healthcare Rise. I'm going to change it. Go ahead and let Selena. I'll do mine. During... We're going to hear from Selena right now. <laughs> Where'd she go? Sorry, you guys get to see it all. Give us an update from Healthcare Rise. Thank you, Selena. <laughs> Yeah, I was so updated. I no longer look like that. That was during the pandemic. But anyways, my name is Selena. Oh, I forgot to take the box. My name is Selena. I'm a community organizer with Healthcare Rights in Arizona. Um, some of you might know us by our proposition last year, Proposition 209, to protect families against medical tax collectors. I wanted to give a quick update on that because I noticed I have not made an update in LB12. So we were able to pass that proposition to protect families' assets from medical debt collectors with 72% of the votes. And we wanted every single county, which is something that is rarely seen. Um, and so you're probably all wondering what's next. Are its health rights and shutting down? Is it done and over with? And the truth is that it's not. There's still a lot more work to do. Um, we will be working on a ballot initiative for 2024. It could be continuing our work with medical debt. It could be capping the cost of prescription drugs, or it could be expanding access. We still don't know. We still are uh, waiting on research and polls. Um, but who here is a healthcare rights member? Okay, I see a couple hands up. If you are not a member, you should definitely join. But we are having a little social at the Brick Road Coffee Shop, which is an incredible company. Place. If you have not been there, it's super incredible. But we're going to be meeting there on Tuesday, April 18th at 6 p.m. Um, and at the end of this meeting, I'll be sitting over there by the back. So if you have any questions, come on now. Um, does anybody have any questions about the work or anything that I can answer? Because I know I, I only had five minutes and I probably have time to spare. <laughs> I see a hand back there. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Oh, okay. So, uh, when you come out with your initiative and balance, do you think you come out before January so we can line up the numbers like the numbers time? So, it's going to more likely come out around June or July of this year. Okay. Yes, so we'll have hopefully a whole year to gather signatures. <laughs> Yeah. Any other questions? No? Who's excited? <laughs> we love ballot initiatives, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'll be in the back after this meeting. If you have questions, come on up. If you want to chat some more about healthcare, come on up. Thank you. Thank you, Selena. Okay. Um, the next slide is uh, we want to welcome our first time attendees. So while we welcome our first time attendees, I'm going to ask if anybody is new to the LD12, you will you can put your information in chat if you are online. And if you're here in person, please raise your hand. 
We'd like to welcome you to our district and I have a welcome packet for you. Um, go ahead, sir. You want you can just tell us your name and where you are from, which area or precinct. Hi, yeah, I'm Owen Guzman. I moved from New York to uh, Arizona and I just moved to Chandler. And uh, I'm a little New York Democrat, so. Yay! Very hard to find a Democrat around here. But, uh, oh, <laughs> you know what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you know what? We'll make sure that you uh, let's make sure we have your contact information. We can actually provide you a little turf around your house, which is a little map. It tells you all of your registered Democrats in your area, so you can get to know your neighbors. Oh, and welcome. My husband's from Queens, so <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Welcome. And is there anybody else? I thought I saw another hand. Who else? Lisa is Lisa. Uh, anybody else? Is there anybody else on Zoom? Oh, can you show the next slide? I forgot. Well, we're still welcoming. No, one more time. Sorry. There you go. Oh, there you go. Um, don't forget to buy your Bada Bing Rambo tickets. The baskets are beautiful. I love them every single month. Uh, and a lot of the money that we raise helps us select Democrats. I just want to know, did you buy your tickets? Yes, you. Oh my gosh. <laughs> did you buy tickets? Really? I bought tickets this time. I know. <laughs> yes, yes, let's uh, get tickets sold. So thank you. Welcome to anybody that is new to our district. We are happy to have you. And then what we're going to leave the bad being raffle up. While we do that, I'd like to see if there's any, I know there is, elected officials that are in. The, well, was there anybody new on there? Oh, well. Well, Susie will welcome them. Um, elected officials. You want to go ahead and stand up so that everybody can see you and then we'll go around the room. We want to start on that and I'll start on this. Sherry and myself, 
Here you go. That is for you. I tried to get as, as much as I could on the list. So um, please make sure that you look for those things. Um, I am very grateful, but I know that Sherry wants to talk about something that's coming up soon. State committee meeting. <laughs> Yay. Oh, come on. Thank you. Um, the main thing that I wanted to point out on the upcoming events is we do have an ADP state committee meeting this month, April 22nd. It is going to be back on Zoom again, deep sigh. Um, one thing that we're really proud of, we got some data back from ADP about our state committee meeting in January and LD12 state committee members had 95% attendance. We only had that did not show up and I'm blown away by that. So thank you guys for taking it seriously and showing up and being engaged. Um, the next thing other than that is our following month, the LD12 monthly meeting will be May 8th. Um, at that meeting, we are planning to present to the PCs our updated bylaws to review. And then at the oh, June meeting, we'll be voting on whether or not they have a new Zoom so link. just to give the PCs a heads up. And as far as PCs are concerned, we also are starting to do precinct and region meet and greets so that all of the PCs can start to get to know each other and come up with a plan for outreach in their area. We have lots of openings for PCs in most of our precincts. So um, we were trying to drum up more engagement with PC, more PCs um, to increase our numbers. That gives us more state committee members, gives us more pull. So be on the lookout for communications from your regional leads in your various precincts if you haven't already met. All right, and then next up on the agenda, we're going to do a spotlight on our school boards. Um, this month, we're going to be hearing from Trina Nelson, one of our newest elected governing board members for the Kyrene School District. Welcome, Trina. Yay. now been in office for four whole months, big veteran now, um, and it's really been um, kind of a whirlwind, lots to learn, um, settling into a new routine, but um, so like, you're probably having so much fun, and I was like, oh, fun, fun is like going to Disneyland, but this is such, this is rewarding work, this is rewarding good work, and we're impacting our community in a really important way, and it's always really hard to convey like how I feel about that. But truly it's school boards are just local governments at its most basic level. Like we have people who come to our meetings and it's like, oh, you live around the corner from so-and-so. And it's just a really interesting experience. Um, right now we are in budget season, uh, <laughs> which is pretty important. Our meetings go, I see some fellow old board members kind of shaking their head budget season. <laughs> you know, making sure that we are being fiscally responsible with the dollars that our communities entrusted us with, but making sure that we are doing what is right, not only for our students, but for our, the staff that we're responsible to as well. And so I'm just really glad that we have such a great um, leadership team at the district level who really takes school finance very, very seriously. Um, the other piece that's been really great is just how, as a board, as a district leadership team, how much we want to hear from the community. We are in the process of wrapping up and finalizing our strategic plan for the next five years. So we'll be unveiling that fairly shortly. But the whole process has been really robust where we've had different focus groups, different consultations, making sure that as a board that we are 
the board has agreed, that our leadership team is on board, what are our district priorities? What does it mean when we talk about being a Kyrene kid? What should we expect from students or families who are entrusting us with their children? What can they expect? What can our staff expect when they choose to work for Kyrene, which as we all know, there's a, there's a little bit of a teaching shortage. So if someone is choosing to work with us, we wanna make sure we are able to retain the best and the brightest talent and making sure that we are doing so in a way that we are able to showcase, here are the efforts that we're making, here are the results. Um, and I, results come in lots of different ways. I mean, there's always you know, state testing, but there are other measures, you know, there's our discipline. How are we dealing with maybe discipline issues? How can we reduce those? How can we be a little bit more agile when you know we do have a teaching shortage? What can we do to make sure that our kids are receiving a quality education with the staff that we currently have or what other educational models are? out there and available for us to utilize. So those are just some of the really neat, engaging things that I think are, are happening in the district. Um, tomorrow, if you want to tune into our meeting, we live stream on YouTube, five, 5 p.m. We have a study session with the demographer. Kyrene's in a really unique position where, unlike some of our other districts here in the East Valley, we are fairly lab. So, and you know, with our housing rate, you know, our housing, we're not turning over a lot of houses. So we're really keeping track of our enrollment. And we do have that, you know, declining enrollment due to, we don't have a lot of, we never have as many incoming kindergartners as we have, as we have exiting eighth graders. And the demographer comes every two years to kind of really dig into the data around that and why that is happening. And it's a really interesting, um, piece of information so but again LD12 you are great you're also supportive and it's just great to be part of a community that really appreciates public education thank you Trina next up we're doing another school board spot, uh, spotlight we have Amanda Steele from Tempe Union High School Governing Board she was also newly elected and has become the vice president of the board. <laughs> Day one. Day one. <laughs> First off, thank you, because LD12 was a huge, huge part of my campaign. I appreciated all of the help, all of the people, and all of the relationships that I made during my campaign. So thank you. Can I have to stand in this box? <laughs> it has been a whirlwind, and it was interesting to listen to you, Trina. Um, we are in finance season, we are in budget season, and as the Vice President of Tempe Union High School District, I am responsible to sign all of the money that goes out each week. And that was quite a responsibility to take on on day one. So um, I'm a hands-on learner. I am a person that really wants to dig in and really understand. So right after I joined the school board, I joined an organization called School Board Partners, which I have been really taking in a lot of information and through them, they gave me an opportunity to do a scholarship with an organization called Edgenomics. So I did get some school board and finance training, which has been very, very helpful and still overwhelming because it is a lot of information to take on in just a short period of a few months. Um, with that, we're also, they're just finishing their strategic plan. Tempe Union is actually just starting ours. So we have currently held two townhouse meetings, town, town hall meetings or forum meetings and we have two more opportunities that I would love to have public education supporters at um, on, I'm gonna pull out my phone just so I give you the correct information, but April 18th, we have it right here. Are you gonna put it out there? Go ahead. Perfect. On April 18th at Mountain Point High School from 6 to 8 p.m., it's in the library. There is a strategic planning meeting. We want community there. This is the future of public education. This is the future of our students, our future leaders. We want to have the community there. So tell your friends, family, children, grandchildren that this is an opportunity to have your voice heard in our strategic plan. And then for the first time ever, Tempe Union is going into the Guadalupe community and we are having our very own one at Frank Elementary School on April 27th from 6 to 8 p.m. We are working directly with the town of Guadalupe. And it's quite an honor to not only be in a district that has 
so many plans to open up communications for so many different marginalized communities. So that is one of them I'm grateful to be a part of. Um, joining a school board is a lot. They don't prepare you for this. It doesn't matter how much training you think you have or how many committees you thought you've joined. Actually being on the school board is a humongous responsibility, but it's a, it's a privilege in the sense that I get to listen to your voices, we get to listen to your voices and bring that to the table. So it is so important to have these local positions and it's even more important to have the community involved in these local positions. So it's great that we have people that come to the meetings. I hope to see even more participation. I'd like to see even more community engagement. Our first two study sessions that we've had for forums have been low attendance. A lot of it are the people that come to the same exact meetings as it is. It'd be really great to see more community members come and be a part of this because this is an opportunity to shape the next five years of Tempe Union School District. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go into our April uh, speakers for the uh, Tempe Church, which is. Uh, Lauren Cuby and I'm gonna get this wrong. Dawn, oh, she just said, don't say her last name. <laughs> it's what? Okay. Um, before we get started, the slides are, we did the slides are incorporated into ours for their presentation, so it'll let me know. We're gonna give them, just like we did last month, we're gonna give them 10 minutes to give their opening presentation. Then we're gonna open it to the floor. We're gonna open it to the Tempe members that'll be affected by the vote. So if you have questions, my timekeeper, Paul, who did a great job, um, is gonna help us keep track of time so we can get you guys out on time. I know we started a little late, so thank you again for your patience as we switched over the Zoom account. So, um, is there anything else? You guys ready? Okay. All right. You're going to go up first. Okay. Just remember that. Too. And then let me get this so that I'm not here. Okay. Hi, everyone. So good to be home and see you. And just as background, I'm Dawn. Um, I live here in LG12. And um, if you know my name, it might be because I am one of the founders of Save Our Schools in Arizona and have knocked many doors <laughs> over the decades here um, in our wonderful community. So it's great to be home. Um, do we do we get to see the slides? Yeah. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Oh, okay. So Tempe first, if this sounds like a new name to you, it is, because this is a coalition of residents, all volunteer, that formed specifically to respond to this proposition of proposals that will be on Tempe's municipal ballot. Um, we, you know, we make up small businesses, educators, retirees, and I love the gamut of everyone in our community who was concerned about the impact that this proposal will have both on our tax dollars, but also many other issues in our community. So that's who we are, an all-volunteer coalition. We are asking folks to vote no in the, on the ballots that will start coming out next week. So just real quick, there will be three propositions on this Tempe ballot. Um, one is to amend the general plan to allow for this kind of development, which includes a hockey arena, multiple hotels, luxury housing, fine dining. Um, 302 uh, is a rezoning to allow that kind of construction. It will be high rises. Um, and types of construction that the city did not originally intend for that space right along the South River and adjacent to airport land. Um, and then Proposition 303 is the actual kind of the meat of the thing. This is where the tax breaks live, this is where the tax revenue sharing lives, and all the details of the actual financials and intentions of this deal. It is 172 pages. 
we are asking for a vote of no on all three of them. Um, and again, this will be an all male election. So as you talk to friends, family in Tempe, uh, the recorder is asking that May 9th is the latest mail back date. Anyone who wants to vote in person, of course, can always still do that at one of the voting centers around town. So just to help people visualize where this is, especially if you don't go down to downtown Tempe too much, it's right there on the northeast corner of Priest and Rio Salado. It is along the Salt River, but there is no water. It's that part of the Salt River that we don't think of as Tempe Town Lake. It is, it is dry. It's um, before the dam. Um, what currently goes on there, if you want to turn this slide for me. So if you've driven anywhere in Tempe over the last month or so, you've seen these, you know, kind of blue signs proclaiming landfill to landmark. Well, it was news to most of us in Tempe that we have a landfill that needed to be turned into a landmark because what actually happens at this site and has for decades is this is the site of Tempe's entire uh, municipal recycling facilities, our waste management facilities, our fleet services. There are multiple office buildings on this site, and throughout the year, at least 150 city employees work there, making all of these essential city functions chug along and, and work for us. Um, this land is the same land that Tempe's beautiful Center for the Arts is built on. It is where the very recent Tempe Idea Campus is built on. And so all of that dirt was the same historic sand and gravel operation. That's what used to happen in that dirt. Uh, when those buildings were approved and that land remediated, they found nothing toxic. They found bricks, sand, gravel, and as some of the architects have explained, Sometimes, you know, palm tree trunk, uh, sure, some folks have thrown a flat tire in there, but it is not a toxic landfill, none of that land. You've never heard this before because none of the other remediations found toxicity or what we are being told now. And so that's an important point to me. Okay, so Prop 303, like I said, this is where the, um, this is where the details of all of the tax breaks, tax sharing, um, other tax gifts to the developer live. So to start with, um, giblets, government, let's see if I can remember it, government property lease excise tax, basically property tax abatements, property tax breaks. So built in to this proposal, we would be approving, as we said, yes, both an eight-year no property tax agreement for the developer and an unprecedented 30 years of no property taxes being paid by this developer. The city itself, the city of Tempe, says that this is valued at just shy of $500 million. So every one of those dollars not going to our public schools, not going to our county hospitals, not going to our community colleges, not repairing our roads, not fixing our parks, not addressing our veterans services, mental health care services, or anything else. So this is not free. A tax break is not free. And so I'm glad this is being recorded because I'm going to say something that you would never normally hear me say. The Goldwater Institute is right on this. <laughs> the Goldwater Institute calls giblets crony corporate welfare that guts our local services and shifts the tax burden onto existing tax paying businesses and residents. And that's not all. This proposal also contains two new taxes that will be imposed on residents and tenants, business and private alike on this site. That tax revenue goes exclusively to the developer. No tax sharing back to our community. 
even though those are our police patrolling the, that property, even though that is our fire department addressing things, those are our folks taking care of those roads and everything else. Now the developer will tell you they're pitching in for this one-time funds that are but a smidge of what we would be getting if this person was pitching in the way every other business and taxpayer pitches in. Um, on top of that, we, the city, are paying a different billionaire $10 million because he has the right of first refusal on a slice of this land. So we, the city, are paying a billionaire to give us permission to sell to another billionaire. If we can go on. The developer, you know, the headlines speak for themselves. Even more headlines have been generated recently about broken promises, unpaid bills. This is the developer and the sports team owner who was kicked out of Glendale. Uh, next slide. And so, you know, I could fill the entire presentation with these headlines. Um, but this is, in our opinion, not someone that we want to do business with, give the keys to our city coffers to, and allow to dictate the future of our community in so many ways beyond the life of this election and proposal. And that's not just us. I'm not an economist, I'm a teacher because I don't teach economics. Uh, this is the credit rating of this developer. High risk, high risk of default, very likely to fall through on promises. And this is what we've seen in Glendale, in Tucson, in Nevada, in California, all and Florida, all states where he has been sued for non-payment. Next. I'm gonna let Lauren come up here. And I'm getting Paul is giving me the oh, how much time we have? One minute. One minute, oh my gosh. So I want to talk about the airport issues. You've been hearing a lot about that in the news, but there are great dangers. If, if that IGA goes away and only one party has to blow it up, then we will see impacts in our neighborhoods to the flight paths having to go north of the river and south of the river. So um, next slide, please. Traffic, this area is also, it is already greatly impacted by traffic and the cut through traffic for those neighborhoods is going to be intense. Gambling, Graham Resnick will tell you that this isn't about hockey, it's about gambling. We all know about the online sports, that, sports book that's happened. I mean, it's omnipresent, but they will be allowed two in-person gambling parlors, one at the arena and one closer to ASU. And they are targeting an 18 to 21 year old male because ASU is one of the largest, largest universities in the nation. And this is their market. Quality of life, this guy gave $124,000 to legislators, $7,000 to insurrection of MP Kern and John Kavanaugh, transphobic legislators. So imagine the impact he's gonna have on the local political scene. He will dominate Tempe politics for a long time to come. And uh, environmental, 1 million gallon of water, water use a day. We use 50 million gallons in Tempe. We would increase it by, by 2%. So that's just a danger as well. I could talk more about that, but let's go to questions. No, next slide, Bill. Maybe we should leave. Next slide, just leave. Um, what can you do to help? Please go in the back and meet Jacob and, and, and Francesco, who are field coordinators. Next slide. Just want to leave this one up. Okay. okay. Can I buy the mic, Bill? Yes. All right. If you have a question, we're going to ask that you raise your hand. We're going to come around with the microphone. We'd like to start with people that live in Tempe because they're the ones that are voting. Yes, I see your hands. Francine, Ellen, I see them. Jacob, I got them. Okay, so Sherry's gonna go around. We're gonna have to speak in the microphone so that the people on Zoom can hear you. Please speak loudly. We'll give you 30 seconds to ask a question. We'll ask that you try to limit it to one minute responses just so we can try to get as many questions in um, to the night. So there you go. Just make sure you come forward so they can hear you. Okay, go ahead. Hey, Lord, this is Rick Epstein. Uh, one thing I just want to mention that, Don, you're much more than just a organizer. You really give your background. You're a teacher, a professor, uh, so. 
Anyway, I wanted to make a comment that you know we all drive around town and we see these signs that say 6,900 new jobs. How many people think there's going to be 6,900 new jobs? We all know the hockey team is already playing in Tempe. So the people working at the hockey game today are going to be the same ones that are working there at wherever they go. Okay. And the other is if they're building hotels, well, all those hotel workers that have tax free are going to be coming from hotels that are closing down because the other hotels have to be taxed. So why should this one not be taxed? So I don't think there's really any new jobs because restaurant workers, they're going to come from restaurants that are closing down that have to be taxed. Yeah, it's important to note that the job numbers are all over the place. And in the development agreement, it says 3,300 jobs. That's what we're voting on in Prop 303. But on the yard side, the signs, it says 6,900. So, and we're talking low wage jobs. We're talking about workers who won't be able to live even near there. And Gail Shanks, who's the owner of Changing Hands, talks about that how only two of the 55 employees can actually afford to live in Tempe. Hi, I'm Francine Bard, and I live at Covington and Rural. But my concern is could the city council still do this even if we say no? Oh, that's a good question. Good job. <laughs> um, I, Mayor Corey Woods, is one of the many people that I have knocked the doors for in the past in many years and am um, good friends with. And um, he has vowed that uh, if, when this proposal is rejected, they will take about a month, regroup, and come up with a uh, aggressive community listening process to go back and see what. What does the city want? And so, and I believe him. So could they? Technically, yes. But I do believe that the intention will be that they have heard from voters and this will go differently. Jacob over there. And then, and then Ellen. Hi, uh, my name is Jay. I actually live in the immediate area of uh, where the proposed project is uh, going to be situated. Um, my question is for those who um, our renters, tenants, things of that nature, how would that impact them specifically? Well, we already know, of course, that we have an affordable housing crisis statewide. Um, Tempe's population is almost 60% renters. Um, as we have been knocking on doors, having community listening and you know, uh, information sessions, we are already hearing um, tenants, students, folks on fixed incomes, um, retirees, that their landlords are already saying to them, hey, you know, there's gonna be new construction, just wanna give you a heads up. So, I mean, we've seen this all before. This is going to drive up rents, it's going to drive up leases. Um, Lauren already mentioned Gail Shanks of our beloved Changing Hands bookstore. She talks about how as, the, you know, that store started on Hill Avenue, and then it inched further down Mill Avenue, and then ultimately moved right to Wabi Bay and Flintock. And she says that was because of big box development. You know, this developer, um, we can see in the schematics of what this development is supposed to look like. It's all Las Vegas restaurants. It's a coffee roaster from Oregon. We have coffee roasters <laughs> here in town. And so I think that um, we, we we can look at history and know what this is going to do to housing prices, to lease prices, which will, of course, inordinately affect our lowest income, our fixed income, and our small businesses. And, and this isn't just conjecture. There was a survey done by uh, JC Bradbury, a noted sports economist, who, um, you know, these 130 studies show that local economies do not benefit from subsidies for sports stadiums, nor do sports stadiums help local economies. A University of Chicago economist, a guy named Sanderson, said, you're better off taking $20 bills of subsidy and just dumping it in a helicopter across the city if you really want to spur a local economy. Ellen <laughs> 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 Shaw, Mayor Shaw, Mayor
He claimed that the old regular Glendale swamp would change in the rules. <laughs> yes, I have also heard that that is the explanation. Interestingly, Glendale Science Mayor and City Manager have been very vocal. Um, they're even in our voter pamphlet saying, Tempe, hey, learn from our mistakes, don't do this. Um, in fact, the Coyotes asked to continue renting and it was Glendale who finally said, enough is enough, you gotta go. We've got over uh, $1.5 million of unpaid bills from you, enough is enough. And they did say it was human error that the bills hadn't been paid and then the state of Arizona showed all the certified letters saying, well, here's the letters you accepted. So the intro, all right. The other question is the bonds. Now, Murillo stated that we are not responsible for the bonds if somebody revolts on that. Can you explain that? So um, it is true that the city of Tempe would not be responsible, but there's a very risky time period before the buildings get built. And the developer has the authority to assess businesses in the area and pay for the, the, the bond obligations every year. So once it is built, and this is arena, right? What happens if they go bankrupt? Right. Well, they had an agreement with Glendale. If they went bankrupt, they had a non-relocation agreement and they would you know, somehow find a way to stay. The NHL, the bankruptcy judge tore that up. <laughs> And the NHL came to Glendale and said, now you have to pay $50 million to keep the team here. I mean, you saw what Dun & Bradstreet says about the financial stability. So to me, the biggest risk is not necessarily the bond obligations because it will be, um, you know, they have committed to that, but it will be what happens if they go bankrupt. Do we want to end up with an empty arena? Exactly. Okay, we can't hear you on Zoom. I got a microphone. We have, we have one in the back. And, and I think it was not Alex Morello, but it was yeah. Javier Gutierrez, the CEO that was speaking in class. And Pierre Lester, right? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I want to say that it's a pleasure to be here. 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 Lauren, both me and you have done uh, giblets on many different projects. Mm -hmm. Some uh, the tool is for giblet, and we really don't have giblets. Uh, to help growth. Um, right now, we have a four year job that wants to be part of this. We have a number of releases on um, hotels like uh, Phoenix. So, we have a variety of impacts. Uh, Arizona Bills was a lot of years ago. Um, that just recently got off the payroll for our giblet, and that's what I'm going to do that way. And it's now going to run over some revenue into the city, which is amazing because that is one of the indoor malls I think the side of the city that's actually successful because the malls are just closing up. But with that said, what knowing that Discovery had to remediate the land up to the about $30 million on their own parcel, what do you think Tempe should do knowing that you have a developer that's willing to remediate it? You don't know what's like actually each spot um, going up and down that. It's the same deal with Tempe Marketplace. It was a uh, ground. So we did the, that deal over there. No, it's the same thing. That was actually a super fun site, Tempe Marketplace. This but, on that. Yeah, right. But they had to do the dirt, the dirt had sure. to be taken care of. Right? So, with that said, what do you expect out of that site, knowing that there's going to be a cost to the city? Sure. So, all along the lake, there needs to be soil prep and remediation. And the taller you go, the denser the development, the more remediation. Okay. But it's actually hold it here and down to the bottom. Okay. Maybe that myself. The deeper. The, the taller the buildings, the deeper the development, the more dense the development, the more remediation you need. Now, the city of Tempe had planned in 2024 to bond for this with the idea of building before 2029, having some development. And we would have been the masters of our own domain because next door to the idea campus, remediation was used as a cost center and a lot of infrastructure that the developers should have been paid for ended up, we ended up paying for it. We lost our rehearsal space, we lost parking. There's a whistleblower that's been reporting on this, pretty upsetting. So, you know, we would have been the masters of our own domain. But sure, remediation is a cost, and that has to be part of it. Let's say it's $73 million remediation, but this, you know, free land that's $50 million, subtracts $23 million, that's way different than $700 million in subsidies. You see what I'm saying? And so 
Obviously, there'd be remediation and help and assistance, but not to the level of over $700 million to support subsidies. Oh, I thought you had a question. I did. Oh, I'm sorry. She's coming with a mic, and then Kathy, you're next, and then we'll get you. Yes. I was just wondering if um, there was any study done on how much it would cost if taxpayers were to take on remaining land ourselves. And then decide what we wanted to do with the land as opposed to having this like generous company coming and doing it for us. So the preliminary estimate is 73 million, which is twice the rate of the cost um, per acre that the idea campus was. So that was the idea of us bonding for it. So we really know the true cost is what happened. The idea campus got really kind of kind of crazy there. So um I, I think they're talking 73 million, but again, uh, architects who have worked in remediation in that exact area I think that's it's a very um, enhanced number, shall we say? <laughs> but we can assume that the very most would be that. Hi, Kathy DB, JP resident. My question is um, Has this developer done any other projects of this magnitude? Have you had some other things? Like not successes, but to this magnitude, this the money, just everything that is there. Like, what's this track record for already having something done like this? So, this is a $2.1 million project, which is the largest in Tempe's history and could be the largest in the state history. The Morello Group has no experience doing a project this large. That was a question asked by the RFP, and they never answered that question. So, they've done some you know, renovations and such. But the latest project out in Miami with the Tavala Hotel, they actually let it deteriorate so much that Miami Beach is suing them for $4.5 million. And you know, they had to actually implode the site. Okay, so um, 
So let's say we don't do this and we decide that we're just going to do whatever we want to do with the land. We have affordable housing crisis, which is very true. But like, if we re redevelop it, we're not going to be able to put like apartments and stuff on there, right? Because we're still going to have the problem of City of Phoenix coming in and being like, they can't build high rises. That's like a lot of things that they're suing to be over, right? So are we just going to put single family homes? And how is that going to help our problems with like Tempe? Because those properties are going to be worth a lot of money, especially because they're in North Tempe in like a good area. So I just want to know how that would be helpful for us. Yeah, well, that's one point that I really appreciate about Mayor Wood saying, you know, if this goes down, we're going to hold community listening justice. We're going to do a more fee. We're going to do a lot more investigating of what works in this space. Um, one thing to know is that, yes, this will never be the site of high rise, the high density housing because of the airport issues that we're hearing more about now. However, what often happens is that developments that do go in contribute to our city's affordable housing fund. So other developments that are smaller and worth much less and getting far, far less in tax takeaways have contributed five times more to our affordable housing fund in Tempe so that projects can go into um, accommodating spaces in our city. And so that's not, you know, we don't have a you know thing we want to see there. Say no to this so that you can say yes to that. That's what I think is so wonderful and that I appreciate about the city saying, we need to figure out what works there and get community input and heal this relationship with the airport and figure out what works. And voting no allows us to get back to that drawing board. Thank you. In just a moment of personal privilege, I ran for the Arizona Corporation Commission. I was a down bell on casualty, and I'm here literally. I, this happened on election day. Um, but I just want to thank you for all your support so many years. I, I'm so appreciative of everything you did to help me and Sandra Kennedy. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, I'm, I'm Ben Solis. I'm also a Tempe resident. I just have one question. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, you know, you heard me bringing up wonderful points. All of them have been great and I'm just wondering why I only am seeing on the, on the, the poster so no giveaways that will be addressed, period. I, 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 why, are, why are we not hearing these really important things that have been affected? I think they would make a lot more specific kind of impact. So we, we are in a David and Goliath moment. We are in a David and Goliath moment. You're going to be hearing a lot more from us, I would say. Um, and we have just read the publicity pamphlet that came out. And most people are driving your mailbox and look at the depth of, of arguments that came from residents, not templated arguments, but all the multiplicity of arguments against this. And, and you're going to be hearing a lot more from us. And we are at the doors, too. It's an exercise, actually. <laughs> well, Melissa, can you hear me? Okay, next up, we're going to get our legislative updates. Uh, first up, we will hear, Missy, do you want to go first? Senator Missy Epstein. <laughs> Hello, I am Mitzi Epstein. I'm your state senator and the uh, Senate Minority Leader. I am so happy to be here today. Thank you to Lauren and Dawn. I'm sure you all know how much they have knocked so many doors for us and, and been such wonderful volunteers, like so many other of you too. They are, have been part of our District 12 and before that of the 18 family for a long time. And that's why I'm proud to have a yard sign saying no on this. Uh, in my yard, and you can get one too. Um, it's tempefirst.org. I think you can go that com. Tempefirst.com. Uh, you can donate and get a yard sign if you like. Uh, but at the legislature, we've uh, it's budget time for us too. Super de duper fun time. Um, I we just this morning, Governor Hobbs and I and Leader Cano had a meeting. With, complete with spreadsheets talking about some specific numbers and 
later in this week on Thursday, I think we'll have the FAC, this is the Finance Advisory Committee. It's uh, three times a year, a group from the universities, the JLBC, the OSTB, all the various economists of the state get together to give us the economic profile of the state for the moment. And they will give us the most update numbers on what we expect revenue to be right now and what we expect revenue to be, to be projected out for two or three years. And I've always said to them, you know, we have a, we know we have a fiscal clip coming up in five years or 10 years because our predecessors put something in place that would only last for so long. And then there's no answer after that. I, I am forever been asking every, our JLDC, which is Joint Legislative Budget Council, well, can you just give us a projection of how the cash flow is going to work out for when we have that clip? And sadly, they've always said, no, we can just do three years because we can't predict the economy after that. And I just feel like, but we know legislatively this is going to end. This money is going to end. We need to make a plan for it. Well, now we have a Democratic governor. <laughs> It was listening, and it's a great thing that now we can start to talk about some of the things, at least in terms of what will we do, what will we plan for when the clip comes into place for these longer term problems. And it, so it's been just fantastic to work with a Democratic governor, Kay Cox, by the way, <laughs> and her whole team have been terrific to work with us. Um, these We meet every Monday morning with our joint leadership teams, um, and Leader Kano and I meet with just the governor and today's topic was of course the budget now i do want to do a little bit of level setting on expectations because sadly our republican colleagues have left the state with zero ongoing dollars that are new so we have enough money to do what governor Ducey and the republicans wanted to do in the past and nothing more and i mean nothing more except for the fact that we still have some leftover stimulus dollars from the pandemic and, and all the wonderful things that our democratic congress said let's invest in america all those stimulus dollars are kind of still hanging out there we might have a billion or so of them on thursday we'll find out more specifically so part of our challenge is do we just do one-time projects like fix buildings and fix schools or do we try to take that one-time money and spread it out over three years so that we can pay teachers and pay caregivers and pay people who have been getting a, a pay cut year after year after year? So this is our conundrum, and this is what our Republican colleagues have left us with because they decided to give us a huge tax cut for billionaires in the income tax, and they've done corporate carve-out after corporate carve-out after corporate carve-out for 30 years, and now this is where we are. And it's, it's not a happy time. But of the money that we have, I feel like some good decisions are going to be made. So housing, what I feel like housing has been the topic in the past year and a half to two years. We're just faced with so many neighbors who, I get phone calls and, and letters and cards from senior citizens who are, no one can pay their rent. They have to move in with family or they have to go seek someplace else. I get lots of email from young folks who are trying to figure out, I can't find an apartment. I'm 30 years old and I was really hoping to not have a roommate by the time I was 35 or 36 and they can't find one. So housing has been such an important thing. I don't know people who are working, but let's also talk, address the homelessness issue. Our unhoused neighbors, you see, it's a growing, growing situation where we can help. We know what to do. We just need the political will to do it. So housing, there are going to be some answers in this budget. And I think we're going to feel really good about all the advocacy that everybody has done to speak up, to do something about making housing affordable for everybody and helping our unhoused neighbors. So we can look forward to that. And there will be a number of other things in the budget that will be helpful. We'll make some good investments here and there. In the meantime, right now, the legislature is finishing up some uh, final bills. And I'm sure that, see, Patty's here. Is Stacy here too? Cool. Great, great. Then we'll get further updates on legislation from them. 
Uh, and if you ever have any comments or questions, please give me a call or stop me here at the end of the meeting. I love hearing from you. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Representative Contreras. Senator Epstein is up here and she knows everything, so I really can't add too much. But what I will add <laughs> is, um, is uh, there are no more committee meetings, like uh, um, Senator Epstein said, so uh, just any special committees that might come up for special legislation that they want to sneak through. Uh, seems to be there's always a way to bring something up until we're see to die. So um, we, we see things uh, kind of re resurrect, kind of like yesterday, they resurrect again. <laughs> so, um, so just kind of wanted to fill you in on uh, what we're seeing as far as our bills. Uh, in the House, we had 259 uh, Democratic bills, uh, 16 of which went to the Senate. So all 6% of our uh, uh, House bills. In the, in the Senate, it was worse. 309 bills uh, and 12 of those, 12 of those were uh, Democratic bills that came to the House, so 4%. So you can see we're not having a lot of bipartisan uh, uh, luck over there right now. So, um, so instead we're fighting the good fight and trying to keep the bad bills from getting to the governor's desk. Now we do have the governor as our backstop, which we really appreciate, but uh, we're on the floor trying to fight against some of those bills and unfortunately not getting uh, the support of the other side to to kill them, so they're passing on you know uh, just you know party line basically. Today we had a bill that we were discussing now about bathroom access for trans kids, you know, and and it was really sad to hear the other side talking about our trans youth as gender of their birth, you know. So if they're a trans girl, then they were calling them boys, you know, if they're trans. Boy, they're common girls, and it just you just can't get through to them, and that's very unfortunate. Uh, we had, fortunately, in the Senate, they changed the drag bills to ca adult cabaret, but we're doing uh, so. By the time it got to us, we we're just talking about adult cabaret, which is already legislated, and and there's already statutes for that. So we had to hear two bills that we really didn't need to hear because it's already in statute. Um, Last week, we had uh, private school students want to play sports in our public schools. We said, heck no, we don't want that to happen. <laughs> we, uh, Sorry, but okay. You know, you. if they want to come and play in a public school, no, no, that's okay. Hold on, let me put down the speaker. Because I'm doing school, two things right? at once. And that's their choice. Um, Make a choice and play sports or other interscholastic classic activities in schools. Uh, we're seeing a lot of bad election bills, and we're trying to knock those down as, as much as we can. But of course, you know, they're getting through again on party lines. And we know the governor is going to veto a lot of those bills. I don't know what her number's up to yet, but she, she's uh, very consistently using that veto stamp and we appreciate it. Uh, she's uh, being real smart about that as, as far as taking care of those. Um, only other thing I want to mention is the Prop 400. I mentioned that last week or last month. And that's the, uh, the have some sales tax for our roads and highways and where our highways and our uh, light rail and our public transit and all. We're still kind of going back and forth as far as the percentages that we need. Uh, some of the Republicans don't want light rail at all. Uh, we want light rail, you know, for good reasons so we can help keep our air clean out here. And uh, the percentages keep getting messed around with. Last year, the, the, they approved 40.4%. Don't quote me on the numbers, it's pretty close, but right around there <laughs> for, for public transit. And uh, this year they were giving us 20%. Now that includes light rail, that includes buses, that includes paratransit. So we want to have uh, all of that included. And the 20% did not include light rail, of course. So that's, that's so we want to make sure that we get that 40.4%, uh, portion of which is going to be going towards light rail. Um, you know, uh, Tempe in particular is kind of landlocked. All they need is transit. Uh, they don't need roads or major highways. Uh, the West Valley needs public transit, so that's why we're trying to get that transit in because uh, all those folks out in Sun City uh, want to get into town to do things. We're trying to extend our uh, light rail 
out and around, so folks can get around. I know I enjoyed when I did that, when I worked downtown, uh, getting on the, the light rail and going to Mesa, and going to uh, going to the parades and things along those lines. So that's something that we're going to be working on. Um, it it died in us in the Senate. We uh, resurrected it. This is one that's got resurrected in the House. There's two bills going around right now that we're uh, playing with, and we're going to try to get the, the, the percentages to where we wanted it last year. Unfortunately, a couple of the chairmen, there's two chairmen that were playing with this, these two different bills, uh, were saying what we did last year is dead. We want to start from scratch, which doesn't make any sense because last year, every community in the Valley approved what it was, uh, what we needed, and the uh, governor unfortunately needed that. So, um, just some other fun little bills. I don't even know if I mentioned them, but you know, things like uh, they want to restrict utility or gas appliance restrictions, you know, because of the gas stove talk that you heard back to back east and all. So now they want to restrict all appliances and all, not thinking about the further down the road uh, impact that that might have, because it included utilities, which is electric, water, all these kind of things. So it's just interesting. It's fun, you know, um, we're <laughs> a lot of, a lot of uh, stuff we have to uh, work on. Um, I wish we had a little bit more luck with our bipartisanship, but you know, we'll get there. Uh, we'll, we'll keep on, keep the good good work going. And again, like Missy said, um, Senator Anderson said, if there's anything you have, you want to uh, send me a note, send me an email, give me a call. Um, I already have my phone number anyway, call me. If you want to come down, take a tour, see what's going on, you know, more than welcome to have you come down and visit with us. Thank you. Yes, question, question. We have a We, got, we have a question on Zoom. Somebody wanted to ask how she already forgot the question. <laughs> <laughs> so what is how so read me? Speak to the LGBT The LGBTQ uh schools. Are they referring to the trans bathroom bill? They didn't yeah, we did have a discussion today. It did uh, pass on party lines. I stood up and spoke against it. Uh, basically, there was a, a, a equal accommodations for trans youth to be able to use a locker room uh, or bathroom and all, uh, which means if you're a trans girl, you can't go into the girls' locker room. You would have to go someplace else that's you know uh, available for everybody or for for that person. And uh, it, it's it was it was a nasty bill that shouldn't we shouldn't have to hear. Uh, it's it's discriminatory. It's uh, putting a lot of pressure on these kids. And uh, you know we, we spoke about how the kids are are being bullied. They're being demeaned. They're being uh, discriminated against, and uh, you know, there are higher percentage of suicide in this, in this population because they're not being respected. And um, unfortunately, the other side today was, was not very nice and uh, sensitive and things. And I apologize to all the kids out there, the trans kids. Uh, you know, we, we love you, we, we respect you, and we honor your, your authentic selves. Oh, we're talking about that. Do you want to stand up really quick? Sure. Um, Lisa is. Uh, I'll just let you talk. Hi, I'm Lisa Malikowski. For those who don't know me, my pronouns are she, her, hers. And I am now the Maricopa County LGBTQ Committee Chair. And we're reinvigorating that committee because we, as Patty represented, we been talking about, our part of the community is being assaulted. And we need to make sure that we can be a part of turning that around and fighting the good fight. So if you're interested in joining me, I certainly need the help. And uh, come talk to me. Thanks. Um, and then somebody else had another did you have a question for Patty? Missy? Okay, let me get Stacy's update and then we will open up for questions and I have a couple of updated announcements that have happened since the meeting started. So, thank you. Oh, this one's the one. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna read this from Stacy. Hi everyone. First, I wanna thank you, say thank you to everyone who volunteered at the Easter Parade on Saturday. 
it, I started talking to constituents right after we stopped. And by the time I got to the end of the rally point, everyone had dispersed. So I didn't get to say thank you in person. The mood was great and made even better by this fantastic LB12 group. So thank you. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. I'm at the hospital with my mom who was admitted to the ER shortly after the parade on Saturday. Things at the Capitol are buzzing, even though we are done with committees. We, we vetoed today on some pretty bad bills, and I'm glad we've got Katie in the governor's seat to veto them. I had the opportunity to meet some constituents in office this morning from Secular Coalition, so thanks to the LD12 residents who came in and had a chat with me about the legislation that's important to them. My own bill is still swinging its way through the system and passed Senate Appropriations 82, so hopefully it will make its way into, into the budget and pass the lawsuit. Finally, it was ASU Day at the Capitol, and I got to hear some fantastic programs and innovative methods of learning that have been developed since the early distance learning technology at ASU back in the day. Please get in touch or come visit if you can. Looking forward to seeing Renee Newman and the wonderful advocates from MS tomorrow, tomorrow during MS Advocacy Day. Um. Patty and Missy, there are a couple of questions for you. You want to go ahead and stand up? Hi, I'm Lisa Santel. Uh, I was a high school administrator for 17 years. I have had two school shootings on my campuses. Why are we not talking about what we're going to do to make the schools safe? There's a mass shooting today. There was a shooting uh, in Tennessee. Um, I am all for supporting, you know, LG, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce other words, but you know, trans kids, whoever, to have the rights that they deserve. Like I am supporting African American people, people of color, people of any disability to have the rights that they deserve. But we have to make our schools safe. You know, these are the things too that are very important, and I don't hear them being discussed. Every time there is a school shooting, it moves my heart, and I think so because I've had kids come on there. Yep. Thank you, Lisa, for that. Um, you know, I have two sisters that are teachers and one sister that's a work as a professional. And I get these emails all the time from, from parents saying, I, 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 I'm fearful every time I leave my child at the school. And, you know, I, I can really, I don't have kids going to the schools, but I can relate with my sisters because I'm like, oh my God, if something were to happen at their school, this would be terrible. And I really, you know, I'm uh, moms against, uh, what's it? Moms, moms demand action, you know, I, I, I'm with them. Uh, there's, I, I really wish there was more we're doing. Maybe uh, Senator Epstein can talk about this a little bit. But, you know, with the environment that we have at the legislature, it's just really hard to get these gun control bills through. Really want to look at some gun reforms. Uh, Representative Tarek put in a real simple reform to uh, um, not have blueprints, school blueprints available to the general public, which is great. That's something, but they won't hear that one. Uh, Representative Longden had a bill in to just have safety uh, uh, catches on, on guns that are, people are, are keeping in their homes. This is a gun that, um, this is because of a, a constituent of hers, her, their son went to the neighbor's house, I think he was 14 or 15 years old, they had a gun there, and unfortunately the young man got, was killed because of that. And that's just terrible, and all she's asking for is safety. Have that gun put in a safe box, have it locked, have the ammunition put away separately, you know, a real simple bill reform, and they don't want to hear that either. So I, I, I you know, every time that comes up, it, it, it really kind of hits me hard too. I, I get it. And the families that are, are emailing me, I, I really feel for them. You know, I'm fearful for my sisters. I mean, really all of us. It, it, you can't be anywhere anymore. You know, you can't be at the store, or at the at the synagogue, at a at a church, at a, a movie theater, any place anymore. And uh, it, it's something that we really need to address. I don't know. Maybe uh, Senator Epstein has a little bit more insight into that. She's been around a little bit longer. 
Thank you, Lisa. It's it's so true. I have no words for every time I hear of another mass shooting and when I go to school, it takes even deeper into all of our hearts. So thank you for bringing it up. It's incredibly important. Um, they call this the, the culture wars. It's part of gun culture, seems to be part of it. Because Ken has some great ideas that could make us safe. Simple things that are not going to take anybody's guns away. Another one, even more simple, you might think, is there a lot of his bill that says if you own a gun store, you have to lock up guns in the store and they won't hear it. We have a bill that Democrats have run year after year after year that just says a pediatrician in Arizona is required to tell their patients' families our the American Pediatric Society recommends that if there's a gun in the home, it is stored in a lockbox. It's that simple. It's, the, it's what the pediatricians have studied. They renew it every year to make sure that that's still the best way to do it. And all the studies show them that yes, it's the best way to do it. It's a matter of public health. It's so sensible. It's so easy. It does nothing to hurt when it's done. Doesn't take anything away from anybody. They won't hear it. Why? Well, of course, yes, it's the NRA, and here in Arizona, it's CPL, it's the Civil Defense League, which is like the NRA times 10. And they, I, I'm starting to feel that it's the culture of a gun is the answer to everything. We have a member of the House who said he would shoot anybody who tried to stop him from having his job at certain sites. He was trying to make a religious freedom point, but when asked, well, of course religious freedom, of course you want to stand up for your child, of course you want to protect your family, but a gun just because somebody said, I think you shouldn't circumcise your son? And he said, yes, he doubled down three times on it that he would shoot somebody. And that's the kind of culture we're dealing with, and that's the kind of culture they do not want to stop. And that's the kind of culture they, that Republicans keep making worse. That's what we're up against. So next time you're feeling like, do I want to go knock on doors? In the words of a wise woman, heck yeah. <laughs> heck yeah, I want to go knock on doors. Heck yeah, I want to tell people that, you know what? There's a much better way to do things. There's a much better way. There's a much better solution when you're angry than to want to shoot somebody. There's a much better solution when you're angry than to want to hurt somebody else. And you know what is a good way for kids to learn that? Social emotional learning. I've only been saying this for about 15 or 20 years now. All of you who are teachers know this. But what did our superintendent of public instruction say? No more social emotional learning. He's against holding the door open for people. He's against saying please and thank you, I guess, because that's what social emotional learning is. And more than anything else, social emotional learning is how to not become the shooter. How to find something else to do when you're angry about something that's not attacking somebody. And so as long as we have this culture of attack and violence, we're gonna keep on having these problems. But it's not the Democrats who are saying it. And so, once again, next time you have a chance to go knock on some doors with some Democrats, I hope you're all going to be saying, heck yeah. In fact, I'm going to have to practice it right now. Next time you get to go out to some doors and talk with the neighbors, what are you going to say? Heck, heck yeah. yeah. What are you going to say? Heck, heck yeah. yeah. What are you going to say? Heck, heck yeah. yeah. You are. Let's go be Democrats. Thank you so much. Yes. Has to be quick. We're already running late. I have to repeat it anyways. I can't hear anybody in the audience. Go ahead. I, uh, my kids went to private schools and uh, Marco City to high school. They then went on to very successful college and business careers. And I went with my $200 to the drama group for the tax rebate, right? Mm -hmm. uh, today at Marco City. 
I was stunned at what a militarized camp it was now. There were there was a police woman with guns. There were there were two security guys before they would let it used to be you drove up to the office, you went inside, you waved hi, you said, gosh, it's good to see you. You handed in your $200 check at the form. But now it's like it's like an armed camp. And it's not just the kids are getting shot in school, which is horrendous, but they're also living now as if they as if they're in an armed camp. Marcos wasn't like that. I don't think the, certainly the Kyrene schools weren't like that when my kids were there. And it wasn't, it was a while ago, but it wasn't that long ago. So it's at every level that we're screwing our Yes, kids. yes. So she just made a, was thinking a comment about that. She visited one of our Kyrene Tempe, Tempe Union schools and it's just changed a lot. Our schools have changed. Do I go ahead and flip the next slide? LB12 does a lot of fundraising. Um, we have our t shirts that are always for sale. We have cookbooks. We'll have some new stuff next month. So stay tuned. Um, so if you want an LB12 t shirt, let me know. And I just want you guys to know that we do our own fundraising, we don't get funds from anybody else. We get all of ours from grassroots donors like you guys. MCDP doesn't contribute to us. We actually contribute to MCDP. We help. We pay them yearly. Um, I just this is questions that have come over up to me over the last several months. We actually give money to ADP as well. This is so that we can have our website. We can have Fan, which keeps all of our. Uh, volunteer information is also what we use to send out all of your emails. So when I ask every month for donations to our recurring donors who are so grateful, I'm so, so grateful to our recurring donors. I ask you to, if you become a recurring donor, $5 a month, $10 a month, whatever you can give. This is the year we'll do a lot of fundraising events because we'll be prepared for our presidential election for next year. So just keep in mind when we put all this stuff up, that's the reason why. Um, so thank you to everybody who came out to the Easter parade and everybody. I reached out to a few different people. You guys helped fund the Easter candy. We had a lot of, a lot of fun out there. It was hot. I don't understand why it's hot. So uh, already, <laughs> like it's just April. So um, thank you very much to everybody. Here's your last chance to get a Bobby raffle ticket. Um, and is there any other announcements while he wraps up Bobby being raffled? So thank you very much. And also, if you ordered a name tag and haven't gotten it, please look on the back table. They are back there. Um, and don't forget to wear your name tags when you come. I'm looking at, you know who I'm looking at. <laughs> Y'all know they're all like going to me. <laughs> okay, so do you have anything else? Any other announcements? Okay, then do you want to do you have to put this in this video? Oh, do you want to share a screen? Yeah, I was looking at you. Where's your name tag? <laughs> My Thanks for being here. And if you don't know me, I'm Joe, I'm the treasurer of the organization. And I'm not here to go out of the for right now. Um, Susie, can you make sure that I can share my screen, please? Okay. Anyway, I just want to echo what Melissa said about the generosity of everyone in this room and everyone online and everyone else who donates. It's much appreciated. And thank you very much. Okay, we sold for the four for four. We had 216, 216 tickets. So let's see who the lucky winner is.
Lucky winners number 59 and finally that is the wait here. Oh, sorry, I'm being told to speak up. Gotcha. John Busho, you are the winner of the fourth floor. Let's do the martini cocktail ladder. We sold 201 tickets there. Winning number is 123. And that is let's get the other one right there. That is Rick Epstein. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Congratulations. Don't forget to get your gift baskets. Um, it, uh, we're coming. I can't see the time. What's the time? Oh, there you go. Come on the meeting to a close at 8 10. If you have any questions, we'll stick around for a little bit. Thank you, everyone, for coming and joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you.